I heard it when it was $2 a coin. We know that rappers talk about the bling bling, the money, and they hold the big dollar bill bands. All it takes is one crusade and someone takes your gold. And I sold music for Bitcoin in 2013, 14, before I started buying. I remember taking, I think, $600 of Bitcoin, and I bought this coin called Quark Coin. It doesn't take very long on a Bitcoin standard to change your life rapidly. The SEC comes in and seizes the, the, the Bitcoin that BlackRock or Coinbase holds. And it's also similar to like when 50 Cent had a deal with vitamin water. He took a big stake of stock, he was the marketing for this, he increased the price of this, and he did well. Read the books or eat the bugs. I'm not getting paid as a marketing agent for Bitcoin. What does it matter about the price if Bitcoin doesn't succeed? These are strong words to say. I've not seen what's in that thing for a very long time. A bit of a renaissance, a bit of a nostalgia thing. It's taking away the, the slowing down in life and kind of appreciating the finer things. I think the Bitcoiners will rebuild the world one day. It's yeah. the same thing as why my Germany. I get cancelled for some of the stuff I say, then no more Robbie P. Robbie, such a pleasure. Man, you're orange pill in the world through through rap and uh, really cool. You've got something there for us. So before we dive into a conversation, how this journey started, can you throw us some bars, bro? Absolutely. I'll get the beat playing, a little bit of an intro here, and I'll get the... Rich people who just bought Bitcoin didn't do anything else with their life. They didn't. Did they? How do you lose a Bitcoin? How do you behind a Bitcoin? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh, yeah, they want to go cashless like no cheddar, looking at the CBDCs, I see the whole setter, talk about a house of cards, got me so fed up, if I had to choose BTC, be a go-getter, why not any others, disregard the rubbish, crypto graveyard is derelict, you don't get a Mona Lisa without effort, can't do what the feds do, rob you for your necklace, the excess is gluttonous. The death grip suffocates I don't really care about that We don't have enough grenades And that and that's a dollar bill priority And everybody falls for it Doesn't fail to still amaze I'm on the crib like a creature in the mud Swift salesman Sell you anything Long as I could greet you with a hug Convince you that anything wrong With my product is a feature Not a bug A ICL had a hell of love's liquidity That if we were to dump At 300 X's on the palm Liquidate the pools and the dexes When we exit out the junk It'll get you out the funk Chances are the SEC Won't tighten up nothing you did not get scammed, maybe you got scammed, sucker. Crypto Vegas is not Bitcoin status. You got microwaves for Faraday cages. Hot, I let it marinate for ages. My stop loss average, 10% negated. My swing trades move markets. Reset your chart, change tracks, you pen, set yourself some new targets. It's best to know how I did it, cause you got locked out quick. My two factor is, is I don't know how I did it, I just logged out rich. Tailor made suit is what I walked out with. And who am I? That Oz player rapper with Oz. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, over there. bro, dope, man. So uh, much, man. Fire, yeah, absolute I appreciate fire. It. That, this whole track here is just three verses of just consistent bars after bars of just wordplay with the punchlines. Had a little slip up there, but that's not going to happen on the stage tonight. So that, that is absolutely so sick. Obviously, to be able to spit tracks like that, you didn't just decide, hey, I've bought this Bitcoin thing, I'm going to start rapping. You've obviously been rapping, throwing down these lines for a long time. What was your rapping journey like? And then how did that work with Bitcoin? Did they start around the same time you've been rapping your whole life? And what's this transition been, Robbie? So, yeah, I started writing songs 2001, started recording at home 2002. By 2007, I was doing live shows and then over the next few years was releasing mixtapes, EPs, albums, pressing things up on CD and just handing them out at gigs. But even back then, I was rapping about money from, from, from with the concept that the dollar's going to collapse. Like I was stacking gold and silver before I heard of Bitcoin. So when Bitcoin came along, the natural trajectory was, hey, this aligns with everything that I already understand. And as far as talking about Bitcoin in songs, we know that rappers talk about the bling bling, the money, and they hold the big dollar bill bands up to their yeah. ears, like, you know, mad, mad, can I say the C word? <laughs> Go for it. Be mad. But regardless, you know, when I think about rapping about money with my perspective on Bitcoin, at this point, I'm just thinking, I'm just going to, every time I talk about money, it's Bitcoin. Yeah. Because that's the real money. That's the hard It money. is. It's the, the only money. So a lot of people, you got into gold at the beginning, gold and silver. Yeah. We do see people like Peter Shift where massive gold bug, gold people, they understand hard money really well. But most of them are really struggling to figure out because gold's so physical, mm. how we can have Bitcoin, which is so etherical or or 
like it lives in cyberspace. How did you personally make that jump that even though this thing is not tangible in the physical sense of the reality, it is still sound money? Yeah, right. So because we because before Bitcoin, they, they consider gold sound money. But if you look throughout history, all it takes is one crusade and someone takes your gold. So it was the inconfiscatable aspect to it that really made me think like, hang on, this is now next level. And I think, you know, we all for all of us that hold Bitcoin and we got the bags and the, and the price goes up in dollar terms. I feel like that's a, a reward based on values. Back in the past, if you valued your freedom or sovereignty, you get attacked, the government will come and grab you and however that would look, you know, that would seize it. But because we value freedom and sovereignty, it's like we're being rewarded in that by this hard money asset that just goes up in price because of its finite amounts. You know, well, not, not finite amount, the, uh, the, the scarcity aspect of yeah. Bitcoin, 21 million. Um, if that answers your question, yeah. Uh, pretty, pretty incredible. I'm glad that you came over and you made that switch. Obviously, Bitcoin's gone up a whole lot more than gold. I feel like the gold bugs, they really got it right. They understood everything. And I feel for them so bad because gold probably would have been the solution then Bitcoin came along and sort of stole all their their thunder as well. And maybe it still has a, a part to play, but I think Bitcoin's that new thing. When did you first find out about Bitcoin? I heard it when it was $2 a coin. When did you buy it? I, I, then I sold music for Bitcoin in 2013, 14 before I started buying. Nice. Really quickly, ladies and gentlemen, I've teamed up with the Bitcoin Way. This is the professional Bitcoin IT team. They can help you master your Bitcoin self custody. Safe Dina Moose, the author of the Bitcoin Standard, also recommends this professional Bitcoin IT cybersecurity team. The guys are absolutely amazing. They can help you set up a node. Protect your stack. Get your Bitcoin off the exchange. Make sure that you are following best practices. Number one, that it's air-gapped. If you don't know what that means, I've put their details below for you. If you're worried about SIM swaps, reach out to the Bitcoin way. Maybe you just want to know that you are doing the best thing. You're doing all the little tricks within your device to be able to make sure nobody can ever get into your Bitcoin, have any access. If you've got any queries about connecting to public USB and charging points, connecting to ro ro rogue Wi-Fi access points or malware-infected USB cables and flash drives, reach out to the Bitcoin cybersecurity team, the Bitcoin way. Free 30-minute call. They are at the top of the description. And then I started really buying in 2016, 2017. Before that, I, I remember taking, I think, $600 of Bitcoin and I bought this coin called Quark Coin. It was four <laughs> times as fast, four times as secure, uh, four times as supply, and it's dead now. Yeah. So that, that, that was the first altcoin I purchased that I thought, oh, well, more secure than Bitcoin, you know, the whole altcoin narrative that a lot of people have. Yeah. And from there onwards, I, I just started to shuffle over to Bitcoin, but still, you know, a bit of degeneracy here and there, especially during 2017. There were a few altcoins that I did well on. Yeah. But for the most part, there's also the life, life aspect to it, uh, which like, for example, 2018, I was living off some of the altcoin gains. Um, but because I didn't have this, the, the mindset of hold, don't sell, and still you know, work on creating income to then put into the asset instead of using the asset to live off. So that, was, that took me a bit of time. You know, I think, what's the saying? You don't buy Bitcoin at the price that you want, you buy it when you deserve it. Yeah. That, that saying? 100%. Yeah, you, get Bitcoin. you don't get Bitcoin at the price you want, you get Bitcoin at the price you deserve. Yeah, and so when I started restacking and hodling completely, you know, yeah, I've gotten it at the price that I deserve, but yeah, that's the mistakes I've made. And so for not buying at $2, that mistake cost me, what, like $15, 50000000 million somewhere around within that ballpark for not yeah, buying. 100%. So, yeah. Yeah, I first heard about it, same sort of story, $96, and then didn't re really start buying Bitcoin until it was $20,000. It was 200x more expensive. Yeah. Lucky enough, it came down to 3,300. When the rest of the world was scared, I knew that this was this opportunity because I'd already put in those hours by then. Mm. But even now, being around the 60,000, the $70,000 US, over $100,000 here in Australia, I actually still consider it very cheap. And obviously, 
everyone nearly on the planet has heard about Bitcoin at a cheaper price, at $3,000, $100, couple of dollars for yourself. So it always feels pretty expensive. But what would be your message to a no-coiner? That they see the price in the high 60s, the 70s, maybe it's $100,000 US because Bitcoin's going to keep going up. A no-coiner now, what's the type of message? Is it just buy some, get off zero? How do you approach that? What's your orange pilling? I think I think for that there is they're afraid to buy at the price right now because they think it's too expensive, and that's and so my approach would be to tackle that approach of like their their position on that, and it just depends on the person they are. They are. I think the ultimate way to orange pull someone is to first find out what their values are and their morals and where they sit on that, yeah. and then approach them from that perspective because I think Bitcoin has. For the most part, over the last 10 years, it's been like this radical concept that <laughs> legacy or TradFi didn't like. And to for Bitcoin to be like the world currency and on a Bitcoin standard, people of all walks of life need to adopt it. Yeah. And you can't position uh, orange, pilling, orange pilling someone that might be on a different political spectrum uh, if you're... What am I trying to say? It's like they, they are like... If they're on a different political spectrum and you're here, it's kind of, it's hard to communicate with them. We yeah. already had issues during the pandemic, for example, you know, communicating with different camps. So yeah, approaching them from their value set and understanding that because when you understand that, Bitcoin, you can approach the orange pilling from the way that they'll uh, respond to it. Yeah. One question I find quite interesting, or really it's the answer to this question, I believe everyone that adopts a Bitcoin standard, everyone here is going to be right. You know, they will become that new economic elite, their lives dramatically. It doesn't take very long on a Bitcoin standard to change your life rapidly. Mm. What happens when the world in total adopts a Bitcoin standard, but those some people haven't bought Bitcoin? What happens to them? What happens to the world, to the people that haven't adopted Bitcoin when we get to the Bitcoin standard? Correct impoverished you know like i think that they, they're going to struggle in life their children's children are going to struggle in life especially when we look at things like the uh the ubi concept universal basic income and ai coming and taking away labor jobs and even the creative industry a lot of people don't understand the big whammy they're going to get if they don't take some form of action to secure whatever wealth they have now because we think that we're going to be able to keep generating income for ourselves when there's a slight chance in the future that that might, might not be the case. Yeah. So that's, that's my position there on that, yeah. Yeah. And do you think about governments, we've got BlackRock, the ETF and stuff, trying to confiscate the Bitcoin that's captured within those ETF vehicles, or they won't do that because the people that are buying the ETFs are the high net worth individuals, which are the current economic, quote unquote, elite. So that's probably safe but it doesn't provide the sovereignty. Do you see any attack vector on that area, especially if we do get UBI or, or CBDCs? Yeah, so, yeah, so like if, if the SEC comes in and seizes the, the, the Bitcoin that BlackRock or Coinbase holds, is that kind of the question you're asking? Yeah, yeah. and they may not do it, but for me, I think it's better at least to think about and be prepared for what if. So what do you believe that what if could potentially be? Yeah, I think, look, it's, I think there might be a world where we still have a Bitcoin standard and for some, somehow the zombie dollar keeps existing <laughs> and people like the, the boomers or even the, the exes who are in TradFi right now want a vehicle where they can get yield out of Bitcoin or some, something where they can secure it, have a, have a position, but without holding it themselves. And so there's a bit of a divide for me. I think there is the idea that maybe the ETF Bitcoin could get seized. But ultimately, right now, anyone that's selling Bitcoin, they're in a position where they're handing it over to BlackRock. They're handing it over to the ETS. Yeah. And as far as attack vectors on Bitcoin, if any of these organizations hold too much and the price is ridiculous in the future, then they'll have a lot of leverage to still do what they do today. It's just that won't be able to print more money. They'll just have a mass amount of uh, liquidity to do whatever campaign they want. And so I think right now, just the, the best thing we can all be doing is stacking Bitcoin and trying to decentralize the supply out of their, out of their hands. Yeah, and that is luckily something that we have noticed is the, the fish and the people with a small amount of Bitcoin 
over the, the last bear market really accumulated like crazy. It did more people were holding Bitcoin and the concentrated wealth in those bigger wallets had come down and been spread out, which was good to see. But we also do see that Coinbase is a custodian for about 90% of the Bitcoin ETFs. They're also the custodian for MicroStrategy, Michael Saylor's. It's a huge amount and the US government itself has confiscated over 1% of the Bitcoin supply as well. So they're actually one of the largest holders within Bitcoin, which I find pretty interesting, especially when they said that they'd have to sell it, I believe, either by March this year or last year, and they're still holding on to that. And I just wonder why they originally said they had to. And I do hope they keep it on their balance sheet long term. The SEC? Uh, not, not the SEC, the not the US Treasury, but it can, comes under a, a jurisdiction or like a, a government corporation that deals with when, when they confiscate wealth and then selling that off and then putting it back in. Mm. To me, it makes zero sense. They've got, you know, over 210,000 Bitcoin to sell it for fiat when they can print fiat mm. and, and definitely, you know, like even if they don't believe in it, maybe just get some just in case. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, I know what you're saying there. So like they're holding what two hundred thousand Bitcoin, and they don't they don't need to sell it now. I know back in the past they would they would auction it off, like yeah. whatever uh, the Silk Road money they auctioned off. They didn't have the perspective on Bitcoin uh, back then that they have today. So I think yeah, you're right. That they, they, they can just keep printing money, and they know they hold two hundred thousand Bitcoin, and printing money increases the inflation, which increases assets going up. I think they've worked out the hack there. So I don't think they'll be selling. Yeah. I think they'll be hodling it. Yeah, and I really hope that they do. I think that's better for actually the world because the US is the world reserve currency at the moment. So it'd be cool to see what happens, say, in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, not thinking what happens tomorrow. Bitcoin is caught by, obviously, I believe it's the closest thing to absolute truth that we've got on planet earth and that takes a long time to understand i think if you put in the hours a lot of people get there but the way that bitcoin's really grown and spread out through humanity or over the earth i think through like the mimetic warfare the memes the culture and dropping bars about bitcoin's a huge culture shift you were saying earlier the, the rappers talking about the money and the fiat gains and the lambos and that rich lifestyle mm. but to be spitting bars about the truth i think that's a really cool way i know you're only putting out like one song per year mm about bitcoin but you started putting out more and more is that because you've studied bitcoin a lot more and you think it's more important or why get out more information why change your approach the change the change of approach is that you know i do my standard rap hip-hop alternative genre stuff yeah and then i'll do the bitcoin stuff and over the last six years or so since 2019 when i released the official the original uh bitcoin slang song it's been the most successful thing that I've put out as far as the content that I do. I yeah. just keep seeing every time, every time I drop a Bitcoin song, the, the response is tenfold to a, a standard song is. And I yeah. think it's got to do with cutting through the noise, the low ent entry barrier for musicians. So now we're in a position where I feel like genres are dead, but hyper niche communities are fostering. And so my positioning this year to, to move towards putting out more Bitcoin music is to foster that growth of the uh, the hyper niche community, and you know it's like it's where I'm received the most as far as my art. Yeah, I think when people see truth, they resonate with truth, and they want more of that truth in their lives. And I think that's what's been missing in society with the fiat money system. That that's pretty interesting. Would you be able to explain a little bit more what you mean by hyper niche and moving away from the genres? Yeah. So. Let's just say you've got 70, 80,000 rappers out there competing for the ears of whoever's out there on Spotify, and they're all rapping about the same thing, bling, bling this way, bling, bling that way, right? But then when you have, like, just say Dragon Ball Z fans or Pokemon fans, yeah. make a song about Dragon Ball Z, then the Pokemon fans or the Dragon Ball Z fans will like it. If they like it enough, they'll show the other Dragon Ball Z fans, and before you know it, that's the hyper niche community where they love that particular thing, 
and then they're exposed to some form of art that's not from the corporate structure of that thing. Yeah. And so that's that's my approach to creating Bitcoin music. And it's also similar to like when 50 Cent had a deal with vitamin water. He took a big stake of stock. He was the marketing for this. He increased the price of this and he did well. So I hold a good amount of Bitcoin. I'm marketing Bitcoin. And yeah, it, yeah it's working out well because it's work, it works out for you, it works out for me. Absolutely. Everyone's contributions. It doesn't, it doesn't work out. Something uh, a gentleman said to me last week live is, you know, because I, sometimes I feel like I never have enough Bitcoin. Mm. I, even though I got it, you know, around the, the high three three thousands, a lot of it. Mm. I still, and I went as hard as I could. I never feel like I have enough. And what he said to me is like, well, part of the, the number going up is your fault. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you're talking about it. You're getting out there. If people are interested, then they're going to w- buy some. And it's quite a conundrum because the cheaper it is, the more we can get. And if we're focused on greed, you wouldn't talk about it. You'd be quiet. No Bitcoiner would have talked about it from the very start. It would have been just the cypher punks kept it within their community. And it actually wouldn't have gone anywhere and gotten to like a $1.3 trillion market cap. Mm. But people get onto the Bitcoin standard. They start adopting it. They're like, okay, there's no marketing team. There's no CEO. We're not being paid for this. But this is so important. Like as Nico Moran says, it's Bitcoin or slavery. Like read the books or eat the bugs. It's like the 2030 agenda and all these things that are happening. Without Bitcoin there is very little hope. Well, there's no hope. Like we live in a very nihilistic world without Bitcoin. I just find that pretty amazing. And when he said that, I'm like, oh, okay, like we're going to stop, stop doing this podcast. We can keep the price here for a while. But don't you, don't you find that pretty funny? Like there's, we're not paid to talk about Bitcoin, mm. but we just feel that purpose. What's that purpose for you look like? Like what drives you? Because talking about it, getting that culture shift out there, you're, you're making it more expensive to buy more for yourself. Yeah, right. It's not like I pre-mined Bitcoin and then started rapping about it. Yeah, know? that's I right. Had, I had to buy it at whatever like price. Like everyone. Like, like everyone. everyone. Like everyone. Like yourself yeah. and everyone. But I think it's like I'm not getting paid as a marketing agent for Bitcoin. Like I take on the responsibility to protect my funds and I want my funds to – like if I'm putting my life savings in Bitcoin and to pass on generational wealth, the next best thing I can do is to bring awareness of the thing that will outlast me and I can pass on to my family. Yeah. But it's also the other aspect of the open source nature. So you can sh- you can choose to not be part of Bitcoin. You can. You can choose to make songs or not. Yeah. And if you're involved, then it helps the ecosystem. Yeah. As far as like – pushing the price forward or you know making it more expensive to for me to buy for me the price isn't important it's yeah. it's more like what does it matter about the price if bitcoin doesn't succeed that's right you know yep say we didn't have bitcoin and they still want to bring out cbdc's digital ids ubi are there any other options we brought up gold as well but in a digital age, do you think there is any other option to provide hope or to you is Bitcoin the one and only thing that can realign humanity back to truth on a monetary system? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, with the with the CBDCs, the UBI concept, and, and there was an article we were reading yesterday, something about tesla vehicles having cameras to watch people as they drive to see if they're distracted or tired like this whole digital thing if if the central entities the corporations organizations are holding uh, controlling this narrative or even the approach to that then we're pretty screwed so yeah. bitcoin is like that book software it's it's some form of a, a soft weapon you know yeah and it's these are strong words to say um it's hard to say them but at the same time it's one of these things where it's it's a it's a form of peaceful protest it's a form of civil disobedience to an extent as well and it's a thorn in the you know it's a thorn in their backside yeah it is definitely a thorn in their backside and what i see happening though is bitcoin gets more and more increased in the market cap especially once it's in us dollars over a hundred thousand dollars a lot of these high net worth individuals are going to understand that it's a hard asset they're going to start getting in there and i think we're going to see the people some of the people that have been opposed to it mm. start coming pro for it jamie demon i don't see him changing <laughs> his tune anytime soon but 
I believe with 100% certainty, and I'm happy to be wrong, I believe he's buying. And then Jeff Bezos, we're seeing all these billionaires, multimillionaires, selling a lot of their stock, and the Bitcoin price is pumping, and they weren't selling their stock before the Bitcoin ETF. I don't know if there's a coincidence there mm. or not, but I feel like some of the people that are fudding Bitcoin are probably stacking it behind the scenes. And I'm actually, that makes me quite bullish because I believe when they're happy and they feel like they're ready, then they'll be like, hey, this is a, a good thing. Obviously, the price is going to be a lot higher, so it's probably better to buy a stack and chill now. But I, I, yeah, I, I think just, you, you know, you get Bitcoin at the price you deserve, but also that other meme, you can't change Bitcoin. Bitcoin changes you, and yes. I think think that's pretty cool. This is old school, man. Like, I've not seen what's in that thing for a very long time. you got vinyl. That's, uh, that's crazy. Why come out with vinyl? Like, vinyl's had a little bit of a comeback, really, it has. hasn't it, man? A bit of a renaissance, a bit of a nostalgia thing. I mean, when you hold vinyl, the thing that spins me out the most is just that audio is on the, is on the wax. Just drop a needle on it, you know? Yeah. And obviously, like, this was the medium back in the 70s and 80s yeah. to, put, to play music and even if, if you go back to throughout the history of recorded music on uh, ceramic cylinders but there's something about this this is not digital so yeah. like if the internet goes out like people want to say right then yeah. I've got a record here I can put on a thing and I can spin it with no electricity I can still hear something but more so I, I grew up listening to hip hop on vinyl I loved that one side would have an instrumental the other side the song and then I'd play things back and rap over it or cut it up even well. but it's a it's a form of memorabilia something collectible uh, because these days CDs are basically dead people yeah. aren't really buying them maybe at the thrift shop dollar here dollar there um, but vinyl has this nostalgic aspect to it that I think is going to just get more and more prominent into the future yeah. as a form of collectible item and also like we see things with like Taylor Swift same album multiple different covers multiple different inserts and people are eating it up and I think they're eating it up because the new generations the Gen Z they want a little bit of that nostalgia that yeah. their grandparents had or their parents had. Yeah. T talking about that, so my granddad's just passed away and about a year ago before he passed, very wealthy man. Mm. So granddad, I don't want any inheritance, I don't want any money. But to be honest, what I would really like is your old tools. Mm. And for nostalgia reasons, maybe I use them, maybe I don't. Like there's a little hand drill, some micrometers and stuff, precision instruments and things like that. Beautiful miter Stanley saw that's all all steel and it just absolutely beautiful. And they don't make things like this anymore. And I think that's probably part of that fiat monetary disease. Like we go from vinyl to these cheap CDs that get scratched and they're not very good. And people are wanting quality back in their life instead of the quantity. Like you can get things off Amazon or Timu or whatever it is drop shipped and you can get a lot of it for your Fiat cuck bucks but you're not there, there's no quality there it's not something that you're going to hold on but on a Bitcoin standard or a hard money standard yeah. or when you align yourself with truth you probably have less things in your life but there are a, a higher quality, I think I, I don't know what your thoughts are in regards yeah, to that you're right about that like the if we look at the buildings outside, these are the architecture. It's designed to basically make us, oh, like life sucks. It's gray out there. Yeah. And then you look at some of the buildings. We drove through Sydney's another area here. Amazing buildings. The architecture was phenomenal. Yeah. And that's a form of beauty that's in the world. And if if you dress well, you feel well. If you're in an environment that looks well, it, it, it amplifies your your, your consciousness. Yeah. And you know, with the with the quick nature of phones any song so accessible it's almost fast food it's taking away the the slowing down in life and kind of appreciating the finer things yeah and if you hold if you whether it's a vinyl like this or, or even if you like cassettes yeah there's something nostalgic about that but it also is the quality because the audio is warm it's not compressed down to a lossless file where it's five megabytes and it's lost 33 megabytes of the audio you know you yeah. want the full experience yeah so what are your thoughts about like being on a hard money standard? Do you think like with the architecture and stuff, everything's going to upgrade and move back towards a place of quality or because Bitcoin is so finite, there's only 21 million people are going to hoard and they're actually going to do things as cheap as possible so that they're not spending as much Bitcoin. 
Yeah, I think I think we're going in a, through a, a, like this phase of awareness in the world, and I think people are realizing the world that we're living in. And so, if I think the Bitcoiners will rebuild the world one day, it's yeah. the same thing as Weimar Germany. The people that had the gold rebuilt the city, rebuilt uh, the economy, rebuilt the world around them. And so, it's up to the Bitcoiners. It's up to us whether we want to live with grey buildings or ornate buildings. Yeah. And I think we. I think we want something that's going to give us peace of mind and yeah. I think we'll do the right thing with it, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. You've done some really amazing stuff. Where can people find you, Robbie? So there's two links, robbyp.net, which yeah. is like all my socials, my Spotify. I update, it, update that pretty regularly. Then there's bitcoinslang.com. It's just a sub stack. It's like a mailing list capture. Sweet. Um, but I'll be putting more content up. Some of the behind the scenes from this will go up on there as well. So people yeah. can follow me there, subscribe to the mailing list and stay updated. Because that way I, I own the email emails. Yeah. Um, if they follow me on Instagram and <laughs> I get cancelled for some of the stuff I say, then no more Robbie P for, for them, you know? So, Which is pre- pretty funny you say that, that caveat. I guess Bitcoiners are so vocal and general against the system and be like, they are trying to enslave you and that can be very antagonistic. And mm. we are really on a mission, or at least for myself, I feel like a crusade to get people to wake up to the truth. Yeah. They can say no to Bitcoin, that's fine, but only after they've put in the work, they've understood it, they've read the books. Otherwise, by default, they are going to eat the bugs. Like, they, there's no other option. I don't see, like, I've put an over 8,000 hours into Bitcoin, mm. and I feel like I need to put in, like, another 100,000 hours. Like, that journey is never going to stop. You dive deeper and deeper and deeper and to the rabbit hole. But for everyone, if you're not on a Bitcoin standard and you don't want to buy Bitcoin, at least read the books and understand what you're, you're saying no to. Man, it's been an absolute pleasure. What you're doing is absolutely on, on fire, getting the truth out there and, and winning like on that culture front, man. I, I think that's so awesome. It's been such a pleasure. And Thanks before we go, just stay there. Hopefully the the size is, is good, but there's that's for you. Hey brother. look at that. Bitcoin shirt. Thank you. Hey, good day, Bitcoin. Nice hey. stack and chill, guys. I'm gonna be wearing this. Yeah, hell yeah. Thank you so Sick. much, man. Pleasure, man. And this one here is for you as well, brother. Thank you. Fuck yeah, cool. Yeah, there we that, go. That's so cool. That that'll <laughs> this this will be going up in the studio. Um, I wonder if it'll be up behind me while this video is actually out um, live. This is one of the things. This well, is so cool. You know, street side by art. So obviously, there's a bunch of stickers here. You yeah. got some on the back of your laptop. Yeah. Street side by art was out there using my music in some of the Instagram reels and so forth. Wow. We started a great relationship, and he's been sending me artwork that I can use in some of my Bitcoin stuff. So on the record, on the back there. Yeah. Street side by what he's doing, absolutely amazing. You can see it on the back of the laptop. You'll see something in the studio coming soon as well. But that sticker collection, shout out to Street Cyber. Yeah, go uh, some, some nice graffiti, go out there. They obviously peel back. It's not like spray paints as well. It's a good way to start that, that conversation. But anyway, again, it's been such a pleasure. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers, brother. Peace. <laughs> Peace. Epic. That went well. Ooh, fuck. One